Uh, so good morning everybody and thank you for attending this session. My name is Bernadette Mortensen and very proud to be a 2015 Nuffield Scholar. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging Woolworths' continued investment in Nuffield. As a result, many scholars have had the opportunity to learn and share their findings with the farming community. Uh, I'd like to thank my parents, uh, Joe and Carmen Galea, my sisters Gabrielle and Andrea, and my mother-in-law Gloria. I was really anxious about leaving um, f uh, on my first trips, and um, my father said to me, he said, you know, don't worry about anything, the kids will be fine, you're doing this for them. They, they were really important words for me to hear, and I'm, I'm very grateful to him. I thank my husband, Ned. Um, he's a rock. Um, despite his own business and education uh, commitments, uh, has taken up my household and parenting duties. Uh, pictured there is, um, is my three very independent and resourceful children, Harry, George and Kate, who have taken my absences in their stride. So as you can see, I am many things to many people and Nuffield has allowed me to take a step back from that for a short time and pursue my area of interest. So I would like to thank the board and the investors for identifying in me that which is within to foster. Thank you to my referees, Byron Stein of New South Wales DPI and James Baker from Biota Poultry. And thank you for all the people that aided me in my research, including my fellow scholars. I've been amazed at the generosity of spirit and the willingness to share that I have experienced from all of them. And I must pay special thanks to my, my muse, Jodie Redcliffe. She delivered her speech at PIX with such passion and conviction that I was inspired to apply. Now, as Murray was uh, opening... Uh, I am a free-range broiler farmer, and the motivator for my Nuffield scholarship is based on my personal experience. So planning permission to expand my, my existing farm was denied due to conflicting land use issues. So avocados was a diversification um, in order to remain viable. So the aim of this uh, adventure was to investigate agribusiness viability in a, in a changing landscape in the context of land use and development. So I travelled to 16 countries over 23 weeks. And most of the countries that I visited had higher population density than ours, but a similar demographic and, and landscape challenges. So the key areas of investigation uh, were the challenge of urban sensibilities on, ru on rural development and practice, the effect of urban sprawl on existing land uses, as well as the use of policy and legislation in shaping agribusiness growth. So the topic created um, many questions, and the first being, where did our social license go? So the way in which we are perceived by others is a really powerful thing and influences the way people react towards change. I believe that agriculture has a public relations issue, which we should be taking seriously as a whole industry. We have a discerning population looking for choice, in love with a nostalgic image of farming which can no longer feed them, and technological advances that they do not trust. The anti-agribusiness lobby is feeding consumers food guilt through misleading information. And we have mainstream media that celebrates our shortcomings and hardships rather than our achievements and successes. With 2% of the global population farming, we are seeing a shift from our shared values with consumers. And sadly, the facts lay way uh, less. So what happens when people who lack trust in farming move closer to it? So the NIMBY effect is where basically nothing can change after they've arrived. So your calves that have, are weaning in the paddock are, <laughs> are causing me to lose sleep. Please do something about that. So as the demographic changes to landowners who, have, who value amenity over production, we see an increase in complaints. So the following graph there is um, an example of res reverse sensitivity. Um, it's a mu mushroom production facility. And you can see the production uh, line at the top has remained relatively steady over the years. But as the urban separation um, has gotten smaller, um, the, the complaints are on the rise. So what do we have to lose? So competition for land 
uh, for lifestyle and amenity forces farming further, to, further away from our temperate climates our, and our abundant resources. Yes, we have boundless plains, yet contrary to most beliefs, we only have 10% of the land, uh, the land mass which is suitable for soil-based agriculture and livestock production. Uh, the Sydney Basin stands to reduce its capacity to feed itself from 20% to 6% through loss of land to urban sprawl. So where do we go from here? So my recommendations for farmer, farmers considering change. Explore the diversification of options for viability before embarking on more of the same to increase volume. Example, examples from my travels um, include uh, agritourism in the, in the form of self-pick orchards, um, as well as value adding uh, avocado oil uh, and, the, and then that avocado oil being turned into um, further products uh, which included beauty products, um, ice creameries and um, farm visits, uh, as well as um, uh, energy production and um, alternate building materials from hemp that we saw in the Netherlands. Understanding your social license and local political agenda is, is absolutely essential. Um, the Nocton Dairy proposal would have been the largest in the UK of its kind, with 8,000 cows housed in, a, in the traditional cropping area of Lincolnshire. The dairy would have been a perfect relationship between animal and cropping production. What the proposers found was that they had no social license. The, the development was too large and too different. Animal activists crowdfunded to advertise against community members who were supportive of the development and raised 50,000 signatures against the dairy. It didn't get up. So when we're, uh, when we're proposing um, a development, we really need to consider the development from a complainant's point of view. So no matter where you live, there is a NIMBY in your backyard. And their response to change is fear. So understanding those fears and addressing them is essential. So employing quality representation to, to manage the fear through engagement with the community. So when NIMBY does believe that scale and intensification is unnatural and leads to poor environmental, quality of life and animal welfare outcomes. So addressing those issues with people is the first step. So enlisting the help of respected community members without vested interest to support the application can gain that confidence in the, in the development. No one is an island. So uh, the, the gentleman pictured here is, is Fraser Jones from Welsh Pool in Wales. So he had an existing um, 300 cow dairy uh, on the fringe of town. Um, he was, he was uh, neighbouring a school, um, a, a historic castle was within view of the dairy. Um, and it took him six years to gain approval for, um, for the dairy, uh, which was uh, aimed to be a 1,000 cows. So ensuring that you have funds for the fight, because you'll need them. So I would make three recommendations uh, to improve the planning process. The confidence of, uh, of planners to use discretion when considering applications and, the un and, un and understanding the needs of agriculture were areas that I found lacking. So if we, we, if we were to have a centralised agency like the EPA that, um, uh, that considered all intensive uh, developments, uh, removing that responsibility from local government, uh, would see a more consistent approach um, to the approvals. It would also aid in, in, in resources. Uh, so the DPI would be, would be able to better utilise uh, uh, their resources in communicating the needs and benefits of, of agriculture to one agency rather than multiple councils. So the second being an approved uh, list of technologies uh, which are proven to address the common concerns of objectors. 
an industry investment in in um, in compiling information on complying development so that we can build trust with our planners. So I research many different ways to retain agricultural land for agricultural purpose. I had a list of goals that I believed would aid in taking the pressure off, the pressure off farmers in terms of development and, and common practice. The idea being if we can avoid the dilution of the rural sensibilities and maintain a critical mass of farming, the pressure of urban sensibilities would weigh less in these discussions. So improving resource accounting and using that information in regional, regional planning maps. Currently, soil capacity is used to grade agricultural land, um, which isn't a, a great system. It, <laughs> um, this needs to be expanded uh, to ensure that our valuable land uh, is not paid, paved over. Incentivizing land retention. So an area where farmers are criticised is selling farmland for speculative value as a retirement fund. A taxation program to allow farmers to retain their land and encourage new entrants into farming would probably be the most suitable mechanism in an Australian context. So the Irish government and the Young Farm Association have created a land mobility service. Their motivation is a little bit different, um, but I believe that the impacts, it would have positive impacts for Australian agriculture. Considering a new approach to living by consolidating existing suburbs and repurposing buildings that are no longer in use. Utilising existing legislation and policy. I believe that new legislation will not aid in improving relations between complainants and farmers. Utilising current tools like Section 149 certificates in New South Wales to make buyers aware before purchasing near, purchasing near rural zones. Right to farm legislation doesn't really remove the uh, farmers' risk of litigation, but gives them the ability to recoup the cost of defence. I found that areas uh, where there was a positive and supportive cultural attitude towards agriculture had more success with, de with developments and maintaining critical mass. So these sort of things that, um, uh, you know, that more legislation restricts, I think, and tells us what we can and can't do, um, but doesn't necessarily improve our situation. So a, a developing um, a food promotions bo uh, board would ensure that food security, that the idea of food security um, is on the consumer's agenda. Community um, communication and engagement. Now, there's, there's, many, there's many ways to do this, but I think the agribusiness industry needs to harness the power of, of media through investment in advertising to gain social licence. So we need to change the image uh, and importance from this, this bad, you know, uh, you know, you know, some bad environmental <laughs> outcomes, animal welfare outcomes, you know, we're a burden um, to we are great contributors um, and have a positive image. I, uh, I visited with the Danish Agriculture and Food Council uh, and they are advertising in an effort, in an effort to uh, take ownership of their image through mainstream media content. So the advert links consumers with agribusiness's use of technology, resource management and relevance to society. There's a beautiful land of 4.3 million hectares. That's not much, but large enough to tackle a few more big questions, like who is he, and who is she, and where are we all going? Is there life after the last oil? Will we be swallowed up by the Chinese, or can we live off their need for a square meal? 
Would it save the environment if the cows burped less? And what do our Michelin stars mean for the price of pork? There's a beautiful land of 4.3 million hectares. That's not much, but imagine what it could be. Just think if everything could run on pig shit and sunshine, or rain could become more valuable than oil. Think if the whole world backed sustainability, and just think if there was room in that beautiful land of 4.3 million hectares to imagine something much bigger. So I may have been a little emotional on the day, but I did cry when I saw that for the first time in their offices. It's an amazingly powerful and emotive um, uh, clip, and it, and, it, and it draws people in. And I think that's what we need to be doing. So it's not advertising anything, per, a, a particular product per se, but it's, it's displaying that agriculture is, um, is an, a part of everyday life. So in closing, the world faces a resource management challenge. And I think through communication, planning and diversification, these are the ways that we can deal with public perception and urban encroachment. So if the industry can improve our relationships with our urban cousins, we can secure financial viability through development to feed our growing global population. Thank you very much for the opportunity and thank you very much for all listening so attentively and uh, yes, good luck tonight.